from the complete visions of and Catherine Emmerich. At the end, a prayer for the intercession of blessed and Catherine Emmerich. When Jesus with the three youths left Cedar, Nazar, the ruler of the synagogue, who traced his origin up to Tobias, Salathiel, Eliud, and the youth Titus accompanied him a good part of the way. They crossed the river and passed through the pagan quarter of the city, in which just at that time a pagan feast was being celebrated and sacrifice was being offered in front of the temple. The road ran first eastward and then to the south through a plain that lay between two high mountain ridges, sometimes over heaths, again over yellow or white sand, and sometimes over white pebbles. At last they reached a large, open tract of country covered with verdure, in which stood a great tent among the palm trees, and around it many smaller ones. Here Jesus blessed and took leave of his escort, and then continued his journey a while longer toward the tent city of the star worshippers. The day was on its decline when he arrived at a beautiful well in a hollow. It was surrounded by a low embankment, and near it was a drinking ladle. The Lord drank, and then sat down by the well. The youths washed his feet and he, in turn, rendered them the same service. All was done with childlike simplicity, and the sight was extremely touching. The plain was covered with palm trees, meadows, and at a considerable distance apart there were groups of tents. A tower, or terrace pyramid of pretty good size, still not higher than an ordinary church, arose in the center of the district. Here and there some people made their appearance, and from a distance gazed at Jesus in surprise not unmingled with awe, but no one approached him. Not far from the well stood the largest of the tent houses. It was surmounted by several spires, and consisted of many stories and apartments connected together by partitions, some graded, others merely of canvas. The upper part was covered with skins. Altogether it was very artistically made and very beautiful. From this tent castle five men came forth bearing branches, and turned their steps in the direction of Jesus. Each carried in his hand a branch of a different kind of fruit. One had little yellow leaves and fruit, another was covered with red berries, a third was a palm branch, one bore a vine branch full of leaves, and the fifth carried a cluster of grapes. From the waist to the knees they wore a kind of woolen tunic slit at the sides, and on the upper part of the body a jacket wide and full, made of some kind of transparent, woolen stuff, with sleeves that reached about halfway to the elbow. They were of fair complexion, had a short, black beard, and long, curling hair. On their head was a sort of spiral cap from which depended many lappets around their temples. They approached Jesus and his companions with a friendly air, saluted them and, while presenting to them the branches they held in their hands, invited them to accompany them back to the tent. The vine branch was presented to Jesus, the one who acted as guide carrying a similar one. On entering the tent Jesus and his companions were made to sit upon cushions trimmed with tassels, and fruit was presented to them. Jesus uttered only a few words. The guests were then led through a tent corridor lined with sleeping chambers containing couch beds, and furnished with high cushions, to that part of the tent in which was the dining hall. In the center of the hall rose the pillar that supported the tent, and around it were twined garlands of leaves and fruits, vine branches, apples, and clusters of grapes all so natural in appearance that I cannot say whether they really were natural, or only painted. Here the attendants drew out a little oval table about as high as a footstool. It was formed of light leaves that could be opened quickly and its feet separated into two supports. They spread under it a colored carpet upon which were representations of men like themselves, and placed upon it cups and other table furniture. The tent was hung with tapestry, so that no part of the canvas itself could be seen. When Jesus and the young disciples stretched themselves on the carpet around the table, the men in attendance brought cakes, scooped out in the middle, all kinds of fruits, and honey. The attendants themselves sat on low, round folding stools, their legs crossed. Between their feet they stood a little disc supported on a long leg, and on the disc they laid their plate. They served their guests themselves turn about, the servants remaining outside the tent with everything that was necessary. I saw them going to another tent and bringing thence birds, which had been roasted on a spit in the kitchen. This last named apartment consisted merely of a mud hut in which was an opening in the roof to let out the smoke from the fire on the hearth. The birds were served up in quite a remarkable manner. They were, but I know not how it was done, covered with their feathers, 
and looked just as if they were alive. The meal over, the guests were escorted by five men to their sleeping rooms, and there the latter were quite amazed at seeing Jesus washing the youth's feet, which service they rendered him in return. Jesus explained to them its signification, and they resolved to practice in future the same act of courtesy. When the five men took leave of Jesus and his young companions, they all left the tent together. They wore mantles longer behind than before, with a broad flap hanging from the back of the neck. They proceeded to a temple which was built in the shape of a large four-cornered pyramid, not of stone but of very light materials such as wood and skins. There was a flight of outside steps from base to summit. It was built in a hollow that rose in terraces and was surrounded by steps and parapets. The circular enclosure was cut through by entrances to the different parts of the temple, and the entrances themselves were screened by light, ornamental hedges. Several hundred people were already assembled in the enclosure. The married women were standing back of the men, the young girls back of them, and last of all, the children. On the steps of the pyramidal temple were illuminated globes that flashed and twinkled just like the stars of heaven, but I do not know how that was affected. They were regularly arranged, in imitation of certain constellations. The temple was full of people. In the center of the building rose a high column from which beams extended to the walls and up into the summit of the pyramid, bearing the lights by which the exterior globes were lighted. The light inside the temple was very extraordinary. It was like twilight, or rather moonlight. One seemed to be gazing up into a sky full of stars. The moon likewise could be seen, and far up in the very center of all blazed the sun. It was a most skillfully executed arrangement, and so natural that it produced upon the beholder an impression of all, especially when he beheld by the dim light of the lower part of the temple the three idols that were placed around that central column. One was like a human being with a bird's head and a great, crooked beak. I saw the people offering to it in sacrifice all kinds of eatables. They crammed into its enormous bill birds and similar things which fell down into its body and out again. Another of these idols had a head almost like that of an ox, and was seated like a human being in a squatting posture. They laid birds in its arms, which were outstretched as if to receive an infant. In it was a fire into which, through the holes made for that purpose, the worshippers cast the flesh of animals that had been slaughtered and cut up on the sacrificial table in front of it. The smoke escaped through a pipe sunk in the earth and communicating with the outer air. No flames were to be seen in the temple, but the horrible idols shone with a reddish glare in the dim light. During the ceremony, the multitude around the pyramid chanted in a very remarkable manner. Sometimes a single voice was heard and then again a powerful chorus, the strains suddenly changing from plaintive to exultant, and when the moon and different stars shone out, they sent up shouts of enthusiastic welcome. I think this idolatrous celebration lasted till sunrise. Before taking leave of these people on the following morning, Jesus gave them a few words of instruction. To their questions as to who he was and whether he was journeying, he answered by telling them about his father's kingdom. He was, he said, seeking friends that had saluted him at his birth. After that he was going down to Egypt, to hunt up some companions of his childhood, and to call them to follow him, as he was soon to return to his father. He spoke to them on the subject of their idolatrous worship for which they put themselves to so much trouble and slaughtered so many sacrifices. They should adore the Father, the Creator of all things, and instead of sacrificing victims to idols which they themselves had made, they should bestow those gifts upon their poor brethren. The abodes of the women were back of and entirely separate from the tents of the men, each of whom had many wives. They wore long garments, jewels in their ears, and headdresses in the form of a high cap. Jesus commended the separation of the women from the men. It was well, he said, for the former to stand in the background, but against the multiplicity of wives he invaded strenuously. They should have but one wife, he said, whom they should treat as one that owed submission, though not as a slave. During this instruction, Jesus appeared to them so lovable, so much like a supernatural being, that they implored him to remain with them. They wanted to bring a wise, old priest to converse with him, but Jesus would not allow it. Then they produced some ancient manuscripts which they consulted. They were not rolls of parchment, but thick leaves, which looked as if made of bark, and upon which the writing was deeply imprinted. These leaves were very like thick leather. 
The pagans insisted upon the Lord's remaining and instructing them, but he refused, saying that they should follow him when he had returned to his father, and that he would not neglect to call them at the right time. When about to leave, Jesus wrote for them with a sharp metallic rod on the stone floor of their tent the initials of five members of his race. It looked to me like only the letters, four or five of them, entwined together, and among them I recognized an M. They were deeply engraven on the stone. The pagans gazed in wonder at the inscription, for which they at once conceived great reverence. Later on they converted the stone upon which it was traced into an altar. I see it now at Rome enclosed in one of the corners of St. Peter's Church, nor will the enemies of the church be able to carry it off. Jesus would not allow any of these pagans to accompany him when he departed. He directed his steps southward with his young disciples through the widely scattered tents and past the Tower of the Idols. He remarked to the youths how affectionately he had been received by these pagans for whom he had done nothing, and how maliciously the obstinate, ungrateful Jews had persecuted him although he had loaded them with benefits. Jesus and his young companions hurried on rapidly the whole of that day. It seems to me that he still had a journey of some days, about fifty miles, before reaching the country of the kings. Shortly before the commencement of the Sabbath I saw Jesus in the neighborhood of some shepherd tents, where he and his young companions sat down by a fountain and washed one another's feet. Then he began to celebrate the Sabbath, praying with the youths and instructing them in order that even here in a strange land, the Jews' reproaches that he did not sanctify the Sabbath day might not be verified. He slept that night with the three youths in the open air by the well. There were no permanent dwellings in this place, and no women among the shepherds. They had only one temporary inn, or caravansary, near their distant pasture grounds. Next morning, the shepherds gathered around Jesus and listened to his words. He asked them whether they had not heard of some people who, three and thirty years before, had been guided by a star to Judea, to salute the newborn king of the Jews. They cried out, Yes, yes. And he went on to tell them that he was now traveling in search of those men. The shepherds exhibited a childlike joy and love for Jesus. On a lovely spot surrounded by palm trees, they made for him a beautiful high seat or throne, up to which led steps covered with sod. They worked so very quickly, cutting and raising the sods with long stone, or bone knives, that the seat was soon finished. The Lord seated himself upon it, and taught in most beautiful parables. The shepherds, about forty in number, listened like little children and afterward prayed with Jesus. That evening the shepherds took down one of their tents, and uniting it to another, formed thereby one large hall, in which they prepared for the whole party an entertainment consisting of fruit a kind of thick pap rolled into balls, and camel's milk. When Jesus blessed the food he was about to take, they asked him why he did so, and when he explained the reason, they begged him to bless all the rest of the food, which he did. They wanted him also to leave behind him some blessed food, and when they brought him for that purpose things soft and very perishable, he called for fruits that would not decay. They brought them, and he blessed some white balls made of rice. He told them always to mix a little of the blessed provisions with their other food, which then would never spoil, and the blessing would never be taken away. The kings already knew through dreams that Jesus was coming to see them. I saw the Lord again teaching from the mossy throne. He taught about the creation of the world, the fall of man, and the promise of redemption. Jesus asked whether they preserved the tradition of any promise. But they knew only a few things connected with Abraham and David, and those were mixed up with fables. They were so simple, just like children in school. Whoever knew anything in answer to a question, said it right out. When Jesus saw how innocent and ignorant they were, he wrought a great miracle in their behalf. I cannot recall exactly what he said, but he appeared to catch with his right hand at a sunbeam from which he drew a ball like a little luminous globe, and let it hang from the palm of the same hand by a ray of light. It seemed to be large enough to contain all things, and all things could be seen in it. The good people and the disciples beheld in it everything just as the Lord related it to them, and they all stood in awe around him. I saw the most holy trinity in the globe, and when I saw the sun in it, I did not see Jesus any longer upon earth, only an angel hovering by the globe. Once Jesus took the globe upon his hand, and again it seemed as if his hand itself was the globe, 
in which innumerable pictures unfolded, one from another. I heard something about the number 365, as if relating to the days of the year, connected with which also there was something in the pictures formed in the globe. Jesus taught the shepherds a short prayer, in which occurred words like those of the and he gave them three intentions for which they should alternately recite it. The first was to thank for creation, the second, for redemption, and the third, I think, was for the last judgment. The whole history of the creation, the fall, and the redemption was unfolded in successive pictures in this globe, along with the means given to man to participate therein. I saw all things in the globe connected by rays of light with the Most Holy Trinity, out of whom all things proceeded, but from whom many separated miserably. The Lord gave to the shepherds an idea of creation by the globe which sprang forth from his hand, an idea of the connection of the fallen world with the Godhead and its redemption, by the suspension of the globe from his hand by a thread, and when he held it in his hand, he gave them some idea of judgment. He taught them likewise about the year, and the days that compose it inasmuch as they are figures of this history of creation, and then he showed by what prayers and good works they ought to sanctify the different seasons. When the Lord concluded his instruction, the luminous globe with its varied pictures disappeared as it had come. The poor people, quite overcome by the sense of their own profound misery and the godlike dignity of their guests, showed signs of deep affliction and cast themselves, along with the three youths, prostrate on the ground, weeping and adoring. Jesus too became very sad and prostrated on the grassy mound upon which he had been sitting. The youths attempted to raise him, and when at last he arose of himself, the shepherds rose also, and standing around him timidly ventured to ask him the cause of his sadness. Jesus answered that he was mourning with those who mourned. He then took one of the hyacinths that grew wild in that region, but which were far larger and more beautiful than those we have, and asked them whether they knew the properties of that flower. When the sky is troubled, he said, it wilts, it pines as it were, and its color grows pale, and so too a cloud had passed over his own sun. He told them many other remarkable things about these flowers and their signification. I heard him also calling them by an exceedingly strange name which, I was told, corresponded to our name for it, the hyacinth. Although Jesus knew full well, he questioned the shepherds upon the kind of worship they practiced. He was like a good teacher who becomes a child with his children. Thereupon the good people brought to him their gods in the shape of all kinds of animals, sheep, camels, a seesaw very skillful imitations of the animals themselves. They appeared to be made of metal, and were covered with skins, and what was truly laughable, all the idols represented female animals. They were provided with long bags, in imitation of udders, to which were attached reed nipples. These bags they filled with milk, milked them at their feasts, drank, and then danced and leaped about. Everyone selected from his herd the most beautiful, the most excellent cattle, which he raised with care and looked upon as sacred. It was after these holy models that the poor idolaters made their gods, and it was with their milk that they filled the udders. When they celebrated religious services, they brought all their idols together into one tent decorated for the occasion and then began great carousing as at a kermis. The women and children also were in attendance, and milking and eating, drinking, singing, dancing, and adoring of the idols went on vigorously. It was not the Sabbath they were celebrating, but the day after. While the pagans were relating all this to Jesus and showing him their idols, I saw the whole thing taking shape and being enacted before my eyes. The Lord explained to them what a miserable shadow of true religious service theirs was and, after some more words to that effect, ended by telling them that he himself was the chosen from the herd. He was the lamb from whom flowed all the milk that was to nourish the soul unto salvation. Then he commanded them to abolish their zoolatry, to drive the living animals back among the herds, and the metal of which the idols were composed to be given to the poor. They should, he said, erect altars, burn upon them incense to the Almighty Creator, the Heavenly Father, and give thanks to him. They should moreover pray for the coming of the Redeemer, and divide their goods with their poor brethren, for not far off in the desert lived people so poor that they had not even tents to shelter them. Whatever parts of their slaughtered cattle they could not eat, ought to be burned as a sacrifice, also the bread that was over and not intended for the poor. The ashes should be sprinkled upon unproductive ground, which Jesus pointed out to them, in order to attract upon it a blessing. 
As he prescribed these different points he explained the reasons for observing them. Then he alluded again to the kings that had visited him. The people said yes, they had heard that thirty-three years before, those kings had journeyed afar in search of the Savior, and in the hope of finding along with him everything that could be conducive to happiness and salvation. The kings, they added, had returned to their country and changed something in their religious worship, but that was all they had ever heard about them. Jesus next went around with these shepherds among their herds and huts, teaching them all kinds of things, even about the different herbs growing there. He promised to send someone to them soon to instruct them. He assured them that he had come on earth not merely for the Jews alone, as they in their humility thought, but for every single human being that sighed for his coming. From the little that they knew of Abraham, this poor shepherd tribe had conceived great esteem for sobriety. The three youths were impressed in a special manner by the late miracle of the luminous globe. Their relations toward the Lord were very different from those of the apostles. They served him in dependence, silence, and childlike simplicity. Unlike the apostles, they never had anything to reply to their master. The apostles, however, held an office, whereas these youths were like poor, dependent scholars. When Jesus left the shepherds and pursued his journey to the land of the three kings, about twelve of them bore him company. They appeared to have some kind of a tax to pay for which they were taking with them birds and baskets. This journey was a very lonely one, for on the whole length of the route they did not meet one dwelling house. The road was, however, distinctly marked out, and there was no chance of the travelers losing his way in the desert. Trees lined the roadside bearing edible fruits the size of figs, and here and there were found berries. At certain points, marking one day's journey, resting places were formed. They consisted of a covered well surrounded by trees, whose tops were drawn together in a large hoop, their pendant branches thus forming an arbor. These resting places were furnished with conveniences for making a fire and passing the night. During the great noonday heat, Jesus and the youths rested at one of these wells and refreshed themselves with some fruit. Each time they thus paused on their journey, Jesus and the youths washed one another's feet. The Lord never permitted any of the others to touch him. The youths, drawn by his goodness, at times treated Jesus with childlike confidence, but again, when they thought of his miracles, his divinity, they cast timid and frightened glances toward him and looked at one another. I saw too that Jesus often appeared to vanish before them, although he did not fail to direct their attention to all that they met on their way and instruct them upon the same. They journeyed a part of the night. When they paused to rest, the youths struck fire by revolving two pieces of wood together. They had also a lantern at the end of a pole. It was open on top, and its little flame shed around a reddish glare. I do not know of what it consisted. I saw during the night wild animals running furtively about. The road ran sometimes over high mountains, not steep but gently rising. In one field I saw many rows of nut trees, and people filling sacks with the nuts that had fallen. It looked something like a gleaning. There were other trees whose leaves were gone but the fruit was still remaining, peach trees with slender trunks planted on rising ground, and another that looked almost like our laurel. Some of the resting places for travelers were under large juniper bushes whose branches were as thick as the arm of a good-sized man. They were closely grown together overhead, but thinned out below, so as to afford a delightful shelter. The greater part of the journey, however, was through a desert of white sand interspersed with places covered, some with small white pebbles, others with little polished ones like bird's eggs, and there were large beds of black stones, like the remains of fractured pipkins, or pieces of hollow pottery. Some of these fragments were provided with holes like regular rings, or handles, and the people in the country around used to come in search of them in order to utilize them as bowls and other vessels. The last mountain the travelers crossed was covered with gray stones only. They found on descending its opposite side a dense hedgerow, behind which flowed a rapid stream around a piece of cultivated land. By the shore lay a ferry boat formed of the trunks of trees woven together with osiers. On this they crossed the stream, and then directed their steps to a row of huts built of sticks woven together, and overlaid with moss. They had pointed roofs, and all around the central apartment were sleeping places furnished with mossy seats and couches. The occupants were modestly clothed and wore blankets around them like mantles. At some distance I saw tent buildings, 
much larger and stronger than any I had hitherto seen. They were raised on a stone foundation, and had several stories reached by outside steps. Between the first and the second hut was a well, by which Jesus seated himself. The youths washed his feet, and then he was conducted to a house set apart for strangers. The people here were very good. They who had accompanied Jesus now left him for their homes, taking with them provisions for the way. This region of moss cabins was of very considerable extent, and numberless dwellings such as described lay around among the meadows, fields, and gardens. The large tent palaces could not be seen from here, for they were still at quite a distance, but they were plainly visible from the descent of the mountain. The whole country was extraordinarily fruitful and charming. On the hills were numerous clusters of balsam trees, which when notched distilled the precious juice. The natives caught it in those stone vessels which looked something like iron pots, and which they found in the desert. I saw also magnificent wheat fields, the stalks as thick as reeds, vines, and roses, flowers as large and round as a child's head, and others remarkable for their great size. There were also little purling brooks clear and rapid, overarched by carefully trimmed hedges whose tops were bound together to form a bower. The flowers of these hedges were gathered with care and those that fell into the water were caught in nets, spread here and there for that purpose, and thus preserved. At the places at which the blossoms were fished out there were gates in the hedges, which were usually kept closed. The people brought and showed to the Lord all the fruits they had. When Jesus spoke to them of those men who had followed the star, they told him that on their return from Judea to the place from which they had first noticed the star, they built on the spot a lofty temple in the form of a pyramid. Around it they erected a city of tents in which they dwelt together, although before that they had lived widely apart. They had received the assurance that the Messiah would eventually visit them, and that upon his departure they too would leave the place. Menser, the eldest, was still alive and well, Theokino, the second, borne down by the weakness of old age, could no longer walk Sir, the third, had died some years previously, and his remains, perfectly preserved, lay in a tomb built in pyramidal form. On the anniversary of his death, his friends visited it, opened it, and performed certain ceremonies over the remains, near which fire was kept constantly burning. They inquired of Jesus after those of the caravan that had remained behind in Palestine, and sent messengers to the tent city, a couple of hours distant, to inform Mensa that they thought they had among them an envoy of that king of the Jews so desired by him and his people. When the hour for the Sabbath approached, Jesus asked for one of the unoccupied cabins to be placed at the service of himself and his disciples, and as there were here no lamps of Jewish style, they made one for themselves and celebrated their holy exercises. Prayer for the Intercession of Blessed and Catherine Emmerich O oh, Blessed and Catherine Emmerich, devout and pious follower of Christ, who patiently endured the frailty of this mortal condition, who humbly received the honorable marks of Christ Jesus on your hands, feet, side, head, and chest, the marks which you were blessed by the Lord to witness for yourself in his own sufferings. We graciously ask for your intercession with God, that we sinners may be forgiven of our sins and be drawn more completely into spiritual communion with Christ our Lord. We ask this in the name of the Most Holy Lamb of God and through the intercession of Holy Mary, our Mother. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Blessed and Catherine Emmerich, pray for us.